I am resolved no longer to linger, charmed by the world's delight. Things that are higher, things that are nobler, these have allured my sight. I will listen, hasten to them, hasten so glad and free. Welcome again to the Everlasting Gospel. We're so glad you've chosen to be with us today for our Bible study. We'll be studying again out of the book of Hebrews today. And today we want to study about the Bible teaching concerning salvation. Especially we want to look at the idea, once saved, always saved. And to that I would add, no way. The verse I'm going to address our attention to is in Hebrews chapter 6, verses 4 through 6. So let me invite you to get your Bible. What we're saying is what the Bible says and what we're hearing many people believe, they don't believe what the Bible says. They're not being taught what the Bible says. I'm gonna show that in a minute from a clear authority among folks religiously. And you can see how there is great misunderstanding and misleading concerning the important matter of our own salvation. So let's go to the book of Hebrews today. And as a general statement by way of introduction, I'd like for you to notice that the book of Hebrews has a theme. And that theme is an urging that Jewish Christians remain faithful to Christ and not return under Judaism. We are convinced that the book of Hebrews was written in the first century when the Jewish temple was still standing and that it was addressed to Jewish Christians there in Rome. And as a result, many of them having their families and friends still associated with Judaism, still having the temple, still having a priesthood in place. From the time the church is established, you realize it was more than three decades until that temple was destroyed by the Roman army. So for 30 years or more, these people could still see the worship they came out of and the form of religion that at one time was authorized of God being practiced by their Jewish brothers and sisters and mothers and fathers. And yet, since they were Christians, they had seen that Jesus Christ fulfilled the Old Testament law and took it out of the way, nailing it to his cross. Colossians 2.14. They couldn't go back under that old system and worship and be acceptable anymore. I wish people in our day understood that and would stop going back to the Old Testament trying to give reason for having instrumental music in the worship today. You gotta overlook the book of Hebrews when you do that. And we don't want to overlook any of it. It's a rich body of material that will strengthen us as Christians and help us appreciate what we have in Jesus Christ today as members of his church. So the book of Hebrews has this theme, don't return to the Old Testament worship. In chapter three and verse 12, Paul writes, take heed therefore brethren, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God. So that's what the book of Hebrews is about. That's its theme. Hebrews chapter six, verses four to six, and let's note what is said in regard to our salvation. He says, for it is impossible for those who were once enlightened and have tasted of the heavenly gifts and were made partakers of the Holy Ghost or the Holy Spirit and have tasted the good word of God and the powers of the world to come if they shall fall away, to renew them again unto repentance, seeing they crucify to themselves the Son of God afresh and put him to an open shame. So here you'll see Paul's urging in the passage is to remain faithful and not to go back under the Old Testament law. And for those who would go so far away from Christ, who would not just fall, because the Bible teaches us that when we fall, if we sin, we have an advocate with, the, with God through Jesus Christ the righteous, 1 John 2, 1. And we know that he ever lives to make intercession for us, Hebrews 7 and verse 25. And that he serves as our mediator, 1 Timothy 2, 5. And as a result of that, when we sin, we can repent and pray, asking God to forgive us, as Acts 8 and verse 22 clearly shows. But now these people had not just fallen. Here he's talking about some who had fallen away 
and he's urging his readers not to fall so far that they fall away. For some had done that during his lifetime and of his awareness. And to them, he writes these words as an admonition to those who might do as they did to urge them not to fall away. And here specifically, as I said, what he means is to go back under the Old Testament Jewish system of worship, like so many do today for the authorization of instrumental music. That's falling away, folks, when you leave the New Testament for your authority in worship. Now let's notice what is said here. It is impossible for those, and then he describes a Christian, if they shall fall away to renew them again to repentance. Why? They crucify to them, themselves the Son of God afresh and put him to an open shame. He's telling you that those who fall away are guilty of crucifying Christ. That is, they do not respect the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. They treat it as if it never existed. And so they put him to an open shame by crucifying him again before the world. Now, there are those who teach that once a person is saved, he is always saved and can never be lost. These ideas come not from the Bible. As you're seeing, they certainly don't come from Hebrews, do they? They come and can be traced back in history to a man by the name of John Calvin. He's a Swiss reformer. His dates are in the 16th century. And as John Calvin impacted much of denominationalism of his day, still today, there is a residue of Calvinism present in many modern day religions. And that's what I'm talking to you about by the popular doctrine of once saved, always saved. People like to say that and they offer a variety of arguments trying to justify it. But the Bible teaches, take heed therefore brethren, lest there be in any of you, you who, you brethren, an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God. It is possible for a child of God to depart. And that's the point and issue concerning which we're studying today. You'll notice even in our text here in Hebrews 6, it says it's impossible for those who were once enlightened and so forth, if they shall fall away. You cannot fall away from a place you never were. Why do you say that? Because the leading rebuttal argument that I have heard for the doctrine of once saved, always saved is this. If you show me a person, maybe he was a denominational preacher, Maybe they were a denominational Bible teacher, or maybe they were well-known in a congregation. Maybe they got up and gave a testimony, or maybe they played an organ or something and were well-known among denominational people. And you point to that person and say, you know this person. You know that they once were in your midst. They once were considered saved by you, and yet today you would not consider them to be living for Christ. Maybe these people are in adultery. Maybe they're a drug addiction. Who knows what? but they're clearly not living in harmony with the principles of the New Testament. When you point that out sometimes, the number one rebuttal argument that I have heard is they never were saved in the first place. Therefore, once saved, always saved is true because those who fall away never were really saved. So we have a passage of scripture right here to examine that shows, yes, it is possible for someone who genuinely and truly was in a right relationship with God, they were saved. They were Christians. It is possible for them to fall away. Now let's describe these people and step through these five points that are mentioned for us in the text. For it is impossible for those, number one, who were once enlightened. You'll find here the affirmation of scripture is that these people whom we know in verse six fall away were once enlightened. Not only did an inspired apostle say that, but the Holy Spirit who inspired him to write reaffirmed that truth that they were once enlightened. Now, how arrogant can somebody be today who steps forward and says, oh, they never were really enlightened. They never were once enlightened. When the apostle Paul and the Holy Spirit himself has told you they were enlightened, the best course of action I know to take is to believe that they were once enlightened. And I hope already your confidence in the false doctrine of once saved, always saved is being ebbed away by looking at what the Bible says. So that's point number one. They were once enlightened. Not they thought they were or they were believed by others to be, but the living God through his Holy Spirit and the writing of the apostle Paul said they were once enlightened. So we're talking about people whom we would say are Christians. Next notice, he says, 
they have tasted of the heavenly gift. So they're clearly not outsiders. They're not just curiosity seekers. They had tasted the heavenly gift. They had realized it. The word taste here is used as a metaphor to indicate a realization. A realization of what? The heavenly gift. What is the heavenly gift that is described here? Since we're talking in this passage about those who were right in the sight of God and now have fallen away, quite obviously the context would support the view that the heavenly gift is salvation. Salvation is a gift from God that is of grace, is not of works lest any man should boast. For we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus unto good works, Ephesians 2, 9 and 10 tell us. So the heavenly gift is salvation. They have tasted of it. Now I know some in their vain attempt to try to defend once saved, always saved, will say that, well, they didn't really absorb it. They just only tasted of it. But to do so is to press this metaphor beyond its re reasonable limits. The idea presented is they did taste the heavenly gift. For you to deny that is again for you to deny what the Bible says about their being, having been saved, having been once enlightened, having tasted of the heavenly gift. If the heavenly gift is salvation, then friends, the Bible is telling us, yes, they tasted of it. Also in the third place, they were made partakers of the Holy Ghost or the Holy Spirit. When we are becoming Christians, we are being baptized in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. That is found for us in Matthew 28, verse 19 and 20. We actually become members of the family of God, according to Ephesians 3 and verse 17. So now with that in mind, I want you to notice that he says, they were made partakers of the Holy Ghost. Why do you think the Apostle Paul has now given us three points of proof with two more to follow? showing us that these people were in a right relationship, but unfortunately now they have fallen away. Do you think that the Holy Spirit is anticipating that there would be some who would say you cannot fall away? I'll tell you, had he not anticipated that, he could not have presented material that would more clearly, more soundly, and definitively refuted such a false doctrine as that which is included in verses four to six of Hebrews chapter six. Brother B.C. Goodpasture, who was a well-respected gospel preacher of a former generation and longtime editor of the Gospel Advocate, a man whom I had the privilege of meeting, he made the statement that every error with which man could come up has been anticipated by the Holy Spirit of God and answered in the Bible. Now that's a pretty deep statement to make, but I've always seen that to be true. It is certainly true in regard to the false doctrine of once you're saved, you're always saved. It can never so sin as to be finally lost. Oh, and if you do find yourself in a life of sin and it's an embarrassment to that premise, then what we're going to say is, guess what? You never were saved. The Holy Spirit has certainly answered that error in these verses of scripture. Because here in the third place, he says, they were made partakers of the Holy Ghost. To deny that is to deny the Apostle Paul's apostleship, to deny the inspiration of the living God through his Holy Spirit. It is to deny the Bible. These people were Christians and they fell away. Once saved, always saved is not true. Also, in the fourth place, and have tasted the good word of God. Now I want you to notice that three times he will use the metaphor tasted. We've seen that they tasted the heavenly gift. They tasted the good word of God. It means that they had absorbed that to the point of having a spiritual sensation and realization about it, the good word of God. They were not ignorant of the Bible. They were not foreign from its concepts. They tasted the good word of God. There was a writer back in 1932 by the name of H.A. Ironsides who wrote in his commentary on the book of Hebrews, trying to say that over in John 6, Jesus said that you've got to eat my flesh and drink my blood. Very hard and strong teaching, indicating that you had to fully partake of Christ. Well, that imagery is different from the imagery here, but this imagery here means the same thing. How could you eat something without tasting it? Who'd want to even do that? The imagery normally goes hand in glove. To taste is to eat. And here you will find a participation with the things of God because they were partakers 
of the Holy Ghost. So that clears that up for somebody who wants to try to draw a contrast like that old Baptist preacher did back in 1932. He never sustained his point because anyone who's reading this knows that to taste means the same thing here as to eat in John 6. The reason, the context is so strong. They were partakers of the Holy Ghost. They were once enlightened. These are not casual acquaintances of Christianity. They are people who are heavily involved. So they tasted the good word of God. And then in the fifth place, they tasted, because there's a coordinate conjunction, and they tasted the powers of the world to come. I think that equates to the heavenly gift and has to do with salvation and a home with God in heaven. So these verses clearly describe one who is a Christian. And an individual would be very hard pressed. It's pitiful to read H.A. Ironside's attempt to explain away these verses of scripture. It places him squarely in the camp of infidels and unbelievers to mishandle the word of God as he does in what he calls a commentary on Hebrews. And he ought to have been ashamed about that. And anybody who uses that ought to be ashamed because it is an infidelic position. These passages say, for it is impossible for those who were once enlightened and have tasted of the heavenly gift and were made partakers of the Holy Ghost and have tasted the good word of God and the powers of the world to come, if they shall fall away to renew them again to repentance, seeing they crucify to themselves the Son of God afresh and put him to an open shame. So the Bible tells us concerning the matter of once saved, always saved, that, oh yes, it is possible to fall away. There are many examples that we could refer to in the Bible that would show that. You have the Christian couple Ananias and Sapphira in Acts 5, who die at the feet of Peter for lying to God, Acts 5, 3 to 5. You have Simon the sorcerer, who has, is in a fallen state when he is told by Peter, thou art in the bond of iniquity and the gall of bitterness, Repent therefore of this thy wickedness and pray God if perhaps of thy th the thoughts of thy heart may be forgiven thee. Acts 8, 22. That's evidently what Simon the sorcerer does. He repents and prays and forgiveness is his. Ananias and Sapphira did not have that chance, that opportunity. Also, when you read through the Bible, you'll find in the book of Revelation, there are seven churches that are mentioned. Out of the seven churches that are mentioned, only two receive no rebuke. The remaining five congregations are told the same solution to their problem. Their problem may have been that they were indifferent toward evangelism or that they were followers of some false teacher. Whatever their problem was, the same solution obtained to all five congregations as Jesus stated from his mouth through the pen of the apostle John. And that solution is to repent or else I'll come and take thy candlestick out of its place except thou repent. They needed to repent of their sins. Taking the candlestick out of its place, the candlestick represented the church, as you'll see in the first chapter of Revelation. And to take it out of its place means that the whole church is going to be lost. Is it possible for a child of God to be lost? Yes. Revelation 2 and 3 even detail for us how five congregations could have been lost had they not repented of their sins. That's what the Bible teaches about the matter of sin, and that's where the security of the believer rests. It is in the concept of our repenting and turning away from sin. When Paul writes to the Hebrews, he writes to them encouraging them for their stamina and their dedication to do the things that are pleasing to God. He says in Hebrews 6, 9, But beloved, we are persuaded better things of you and things that accompany salvation, though we thus speak. He's persuaded they would live up to their obligations in living the Christian life, even though he's giving these real warnings and showing where some had fallen. For God is not unrighteous to forget your work and labor of love, which ye have showed toward his name, in that ye have ministered to the saints and do minister. He also states in chapter 10, verse 38, but we are not of them that draw back into perdition, but of them that believe to the saving of the soul. And quite interesting in Hebrews, in Hebrews 10, at verse 25, he has said, not forsaking the assembling of yourselves together as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another in so much the more as you see the day approaching. And then he says, for if we sin willfully, after that we have received the knowledge of the truth, there remaineth no more sacrifice for sins, but a certain fearful looking for of judgment 
and fiery indignation, which shall devour the adversaries. What's he saying? If we forsake God, if we forsake the church, if we forsake the assembling together of the church, we willfully sin, and there is no more sacrifice for sin available. In those two chapters, 10 and 6, he talks about putting Christ to an open shame. And the Lord will not tolerate that behavior on the part of a Christian. In fact, when you read in Matthew chapter 13 and verse 41, you find that when Jesus Christ returns, that he will gather out of his kingdom. And the Son of Man shall send forth his angels, and they shall gather out of his kingdom. Now, this kingdom is the church. Matthew 16, 18. He will gather out of his kingdom all that offend, all things that offend, and them which do iniquity, and shall cast them into a furnace of fire, and there shall be wailing and gnashing of teeth. What's going to happen at the return of Christ? At the return of Christ, the angels will gather out of his kingdom, his church, those that offend, as he says here, those who work iniquity, and they will be cast into the lake of fire. Is once saved, always saved true? It's certainly not true if you'll listen to what our Lord said. He cautioned against that and urged being faithful unto death to receive the crown of life. Now, where does this idea of once saved, always saved, from where does it come? One source from which it comes is Baptist doctrine. I have an article entitled God's Grand Plan, and it's written by Charles Stanley. Now, if you are a Baptist, you recognize the name of Charles Stanley. If you're not a Baptist, I'll inform you. He is a past president of the Southern Baptist Convention. That is a convention and conglomeration and organization of Baptist churches. They have formed together to form the Southern Baptist Creed or System of Belief. It is found at sbc.net where they document their creeds and ordinances that are an addition to the Bible. You may not know that, but go to sbc.net and check it out. You'll see I'm telling you the truth. Also, I've got this article by Charles Stanley I want to read for you. What Charles Stanley is discussing in this brief article that I cut out, he is discussing the idea of Christian growth. And in discussing the idea of Christian growth, he has this statement, and I'll read you the whole paragraph so you'll know I'm not taking anything out of context. He will refer to a third stage. He says, the third stage of sanctification is our ultimate perfection when we will possess absolute holiness. Upon our physical death, the soul and spirit are freed from sin, and in the resurrection, our bodies will be made perfect. We will stand faultless and spotless before Christ. Now, I've read that without interruption. That's the whole paragraph where he says what happens when we die. We may have been trying to be Christians up here. He doesn't talk about we could fall away because he doesn't believe you can. But whatever problems we've had, when we die, he says, our, upon our physical death, the soul and spirit are freed from sin and in the resurrections, our bodies will be made perfect and will stand faultless, before, faultless and spotless before Christ. Is that what we read in Matthew chapter 13, verse 41? No, it is not. Is that what Paul talked about in Hebrews 6 and in fact in the entire book of Hebrews? No, it is not. This man is telling you something that sounds more like Catholicism to me than it does even Baptist doctrine. You know, the Catholics for many years, at least since the Council of Trent that I know anything about in the 14th century, have believed in extreme unction, or it's also known as last rites. Where a person is dying, a priest puts on his stole, he absolves them of all their sins, and they are saved because their mortal and venial sins have been wiped away. There's no distinction between sins in the Bible, 1 John 3, 4, but they make it. The Catholics came up with that. It's a very convenient doctrine. It's got people falling out of services today in the Catholic Church. I understand only 3% of Catholics go to confessional, and they believe they have to confess their sins to get forgiven. What are they depending on? Last rites, extreme unction so that when they die, some priests will absolve them of their sin, and they can be like Charles Stanley writes about here. They can be spotless and sinless. That's false, brethren. The state that we're in when we die is the condition we will meet our Lord in in the judgment. Again, in Hebrews chapter 9, verse 27, the apostle Paul says, concerning this matter of life and death, he says, and as it is appointed unto men once to die, 
But after this, the judgment. When we die, we will meet the Lord in the state we're in when we die. No priest, no person can come in and absolve us of our sins once we have died because sin requires repentance and prayer to be forgiven. And unless I have the capacity to repent and the ability to pray, I cannot be forgiven. Acts 8 and verse 22. The idea of the Catholics of extreme unction is false doctrine. And now then we have a Baptist preacher. He's got a television program that airs here in Chattanooga where we are coming up and writing about a state of sanctification where upon our physical death, the soul and spirit are free from sin. If they have sin, notice this anticipates that they have sin when you die. If there is sin in your life when you die, that is the sin with which you will meet the Lord in the judgment. The Bible says, for we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ that everyone may receive the things done in his body according to that he had done, whether it be good or bad. 2 Corinthians 5.10. We are going to give an account for sin if we die with sin in our life and with sin on our conscience and on our record. In Revelation chapter 14, verse 13, John writes, And I heard a voice from heaven saying unto me, Write, Blessed are the dead which die in the Lord from henceforth. Yea, saith the Spirit, that they may rest from their labors, and their works do follow them. Our works, good, Revelation 14.13, and bad, 2 Corinthians 5.10, will follow us to the judgment. Therefore, the statement of the well-respected by the Baptist people, man by the name of Charles Stanley, is false doctrine. He needs to turn his collar around backwards and start wearing a black robe and call himself a priest. He's preaching Catholic doctrine here. I've never heard a Baptist preach that. I've just heard him always teach, once saved, always saved. Here he's gone out and explained it. And he said, all you have to do to have your soul perfected is just die. You know, that answers a question for me that I've had for a number of years by attending funerals for people that I know have lived a life that is less than honorable, certainly not Christian. These people at funerals, a denominational preacher will get up, and you know what will happen? They'll get up and they'll say, he's on his way to heaven, he's going to heaven. And I'm thinking, how in the world can they figure that? This person died in sin. He might have been a bootlegger, a drug runner, a whoremonger. And that preacher will get up and preach them into heaven. They've been listening to Charles Stanley. Oh, he had the good fortune to die. Isn't it something that according to the Baptists, you can accomplish something in your death you never could in your life, the perfection of your soul and spirit. Once saved, always saved is false doctrine. We've studied today showing you from Hebrews why it is. Thank you for being with us today. Please return next time and we'll study more on the everlasting gospel. So glad I